Hold on. I forgot my coffee. Unintentional injury is the leading cause of death in the United States for individuals younger than 44 years of age. On average, 15 workers die each day in the U.S. from traumatic injuries. And more than 4 million workers suffer a non-fatal injury or illness each year. In the U.S., about one-third of all injuries and 20% of injury deaths occur at home. Safe practices at work, home, and play can prevent many injuries, illnesses, and deaths. However, once injury or sudden illness has occurred, effective first aid can make the difference between a rapid or prolonged recovery, a temporary or permanent disability, and even life or death. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, defines first aid as emergency care provided for injury or sudden illness before professional emergency medical treatment becomes available. A first aid provider is someone trained in the delivery of initial emergency procedures, using limited equipment to perform a primary assessment and intervention until emergency medical services, or EMS, personnel arrive. The essential responsibilities of a first aid provider are recognizing a medical emergency, making the decision to help, identifying hazards and ensuring personal safety, activating the EMS system, and providing supportive, basic first aid care. The goal of this training is to help you gain the knowledge, skills, and confidence necessary to manage a medical emergency until more advanced help is available. First aid does not require making complex decisions or having in-depth medical knowledge. It is easy to learn, remember, and perform. What happened? The pilot fell off the top shelf and hit him. John, stay still. Some people fear being sued as a result of performing first aid in an emergency. Understanding more about the legalities can help reduce this fear. I'm trained to help. Is that all right with you? All states have passed what are known as Good Samaritan laws to help encourage bystanders to assist those in need. These laws help protect anyone who voluntarily provides assistance without expecting or accepting compensation, is reasonable and prudent, does not provide care beyond the training received, and is not grossly negligent or completely careless in delivering emergency care. Good Samaritan laws vary slightly from state to state. Become familiar with the laws in your state and other states where you work or travel. Everyone has the right to refuse medical treatment. It is appropriate to ask a responsive person if they want help before providing care. When a person is unresponsive, the legal concept of implied consent allows a provider to help without asking, because it assumes the person would agree to be helped if responsive. Once care has begun, and it is safe to do so, remain with the person until someone with equal or greater emergency medical training takes over. If alone, it is okay to leave to activate EMS, but return to the person as soon as you can. There has never been a successful lawsuit in the United States against a person providing first aid in good faith. Still, it is appropriate to use common sense. Activate EMS immediately. If the scene is unsafe, do not enter. Ask a responsive person for permission before giving care. Never attempt skills that exceed your training. And once you have started, don't stop until someone with equal or greater training relieves you. A general impression is a quick sense of what has occurred or is occurring when you first observe an emergency scene. If injured, how was the person injured? Injuries occur from physical force against the body. The manner in which that force creates an injury is called the mechanism of injury. Mechanisms that transfer significant force are best assumed to result in serious injury until proven otherwise. Does the person appear to be unconscious? A person who appears to have collapsed could have experienced a sudden cardiac arrest. Your immediate assessment and care can be his only chance of survival. The most critical decision you will make is whether to get involved when a medical emergency has occurred. 
It is normal to feel hesitant because you are unsure of your ability to help. You might hesitate because you feel like you're alone in helping. You are only the first link in a progressive chain of emergency care. Your involvement lasts only until relieved by another trained provider or responding EMS providers, in most cases, a very short period of time. You might hesitate for fear of making things worse. Your training provides you with sound knowledge and skills designed only to help and not harm those in need. You might also hesitate because you think you don't have a lot of medical knowledge. Extensive medical knowledge is not necessary. First aid skills are based on common sense and simple, effective procedures that can be easily learned and safely applied. Finally, you might hesitate because others have already stopped to help. It never hurts to see if additional assistance is needed. Other bystanders may not have any training or may be hesitant to provide care. Emergency scenes are often unsafe. Your personal safety is always the highest priority, even before the safety of the person who needs help. Putting yourself in danger to aid someone can make the situation worse. Always pause for a moment before approaching an emergency and look for obvious hazards. Consider the possibility of hidden dangers. If the scene is unsafe, do not approach. If the location you are already in becomes unsafe, get out. When caring for someone, you can be exposed to blood or other potentially infectious body fluids. While the risk of contracting a disease is extremely low, it is prudent to take simple measures to avoid exposure in the first place. Infectious blood-borne diseases include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Exposure can occur through the direct contact of infectious material with an open wound or sore, or through the mucous membranes of the mouth, nose, and eyes. Exposure can also occur through a skin puncture with a contaminated, sharp object. Reducing exposure lowers the chance of infection. Universal precautions is an approach that recommends handling all blood and other body substances as if they are infectious. To be effective, the approach is the same for everyone, regardless of relationship or age. Disposable gloves are the most commonly used barrier. Make sure there is always a fresh supply of gloves in your first aid kit. Inspect gloves for damage or tears when you put them on. If damaged, replace them immediately. Always remove contaminated gloves carefully, without snapping. Without touching bare skin, pinch the glove at either palm with the fingers of the opposite hand. Gently pull the glove away from the palm and toward the fingers, turning the glove inside out. Gather the glove you just removed with your gloved hand. Carefully slide your bare index finger inside the wristband of the gloved hand. Gently pull outwards and down, inverting the glove and trapping the first glove inside. Throw away gloves in an appropriate container to prevent any further contact. Even after using gloves, use soap and water to clean your hands and any exposed skin. Use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer if soap and water are not available. A face shield can prevent mouth, nose, and eye exposure when there is a possibility of splashing or spraying. Emergency Medical Services, or EMS, describes the emergency medical response system developed within your community. An EMS system typically uses a specialized emergency communication network to gather information and dispatch appropriate emergency resources. EMS providers within the system respond directly to emergency scenes, provide emergency medical care, and transport ill or injured people to a hospital. One of your fundamental responsibilities as a trained provider is to activate the EMS system in an emergency. Immediate EMS activation is recommended when a person is unresponsive. A significant mechanism of injury has occurred. A warning sign of serious illness exists or the severity of a person's condition is unclear. Activating EMS usually consists of calling an easy-to-remember universal emergency telephone number, such as 911. Ideally, one person should call EMS while another person cares for the ill or injured person. 
An EMS dispatcher with specialized training will answer the call. The dispatcher will ask for basic information, such as the type of emergency, location, the number and conditions of those who are ill or injured, and what care is being provided. Answer the dispatcher's questions as clearly as you can. Only hang up if directed to do so by the dispatcher. You may have an emergency action plan in your workplace that contains specific procedures on how to respond to internal emergencies and activate EMS. It is important to become familiar with the emergency plan where you work. The majority of medical emergencies occur at home, so it is also smart to develop a personal emergency response plan for your home and review it frequently with members of your household. Because the human body cannot store oxygen, it must continually supply tissues and cells with oxygen through the combined actions of the respiratory and circulatory systems. The respiratory system includes the lungs and the airway, the passage from the mouth and nose to the lungs. Expansion of the chest during breathing causes suction, which pulls outside air containing oxygen through the airway and into the lungs. Relaxation of the chest increases the pressure within and forces air to be exhaled from the lungs. The circulatory system includes the heart and a body-wide network of blood vessels. Electrical impulses stimulate mechanical contractions of the heart to create pressure that pushes blood throughout the body. Blood vessels in the lungs absorb oxygen from inhaled air. The oxygen-rich blood goes to the heart and then out to the rest of the body. Large vessels called arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart. Arteries branch down into very small vessels that allow oxygen to be absorbed directly into body cells so it can be used for energy production. Veins return oxygen-poor blood back to the heart and lungs where the cycle repeats. So, Jamie, did our forecast come through according to our earlier projections? Um, yeah, it did. We're a little tight with our budget, um, you know, in some certain areas, so we're going to have to work on that. Uh, how's, how's it coming? Oh, it's going pretty good here. So it looks like we can follow through with that marketing plan. Have you talked to Ron over Star Graphics yet? No, not yet. But I will do it today. Dale? Dale? Are you okay? What is it? I don't know. Sudden cardiac arrest, or SCA, can occur without warning to anyone at any time. It is one of the leading causes of death among adults in the United States. Sudden cardiac arrest happens when the normal electrical impulses in the heart unexpectedly become disorganized. The normally coordinated mechanical contraction of the heart muscle is lost, and a chaotic, quivering condition known as ventricular fibrillation can occur. Blood flow to the brain and body abruptly stops. The lack of blood and oxygen to the brain causes the person to quickly lose consciousness, collapse, and stop breathing. Brain tissue is especially sensitive to a lack of oxygen. When oxygen is cut off, brain death can occur quickly, within a matter of minutes. Without early recognition and care from a bystander, the person will not survive. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, allows a bystander to restore some oxygen to the brain through a combination of chest compressions and rescue breaths. By itself, CPR is only a temporary measure that can buy time until more advanced care can be provided. The most effective treatment for ventricular fibrillation is defibrillation. To defibrillate, electrode pads are applied to the chest and an electrical shock is set between the pads through the heart. This shock stops ventricular fibrillation, so the heart's normal electrical activity can return and restore blood flow. Successful defibrillation is often dependent on how quickly a person is defibrillated. For each minute a person is in cardiac arrest, his chance of surviving decreases by about 10%. After as little as 10 minutes, defibrillation is rarely successful. The amount of time it takes to recognize a problem, activate EMS, and have EMS respond and defibrillate is usually longer than 10 minutes. In most cases, it's too late. 
An automated external defibrillator, or AED, is a small portable computerized device that is simple for a minimally trained bystander like you to operate. Turning on an AED is as simple as opening a lid or pushing a power button. Remove clothes from patient's chest. Once it is on, an AED will provide voice instructions to guide you through its use. An AED automatically analyzes the heart rhythm, determines if a shock is needed, and charges itself to be ready to defibrillate. An operator simply pushes a button to deliver the shock when told to by the AED. In many cases of sudden cardiac arrest, if defibrillation can be delivered sooner before EMS arrives, more people would survive. Immediate high-quality CPR and defibrillation with an AED from a bystander can double or even triple the chance for survival. The chain of survival is used to describe the most effective approach for treating sudden cardiac arrest. The chain of survival consists of five interdependent links. Immediate recognition and activation of EMS quickly initiates the treatment process. Early CPR with effective chest compressions buys time for accessing an AED and improves the chance that defibrillation will work. Rapid defibrillation provides the best chance to return the heart to a normal rhythm. Advanced life support procedures and medications used by paramedics, nurses, or doctors help sustain the chance for recovery and survival. And finally, effective post-cardiac arrest care increases the likelihood of long-term survival. If any one of the links is weak or missing, the chances for survival are greatly reduced. The greatest chance for survival exists when all links are working together. When breathing and circulation stop, there are two critical life-supporting skills you will learn to replace them, chest compressions and rescue breaths. First, we'll focus on mastering each skill individually. Then you'll learn how to link them together to perform CPR. If the heart stops, it is possible to restore at least some blood flow through the circulatory system by way of external chest compressions. The most effective chest compressions occur with the rhythmic application of downward pressure on the center of the chest. External compressions increase pressure inside the chest and directly compress the heart, forcing blood to move from the heart to the brain and other organs. To perform proper compressions, the person needs to be positioned on her back on a flat, firm surface. Kneel close to the side of the chest. Place the heel of one hand on the center of the chest. Place the heel of your other hand on top of and parallel to the first. You can interlace your fingers to help keep them off the chest. Bring your body up and over the person so your shoulders are directly above your hands. Straighten your arms and lock your elbows. Using your upper body weight, push straight down to a depth of at least two inches. Lift your hands and allow the chest to fully rebound to its normal position. Move immediately into the downstroke of the next compression. Continue compressions at a rate of at least 100 times per minute. Always compress fast and deep when performing compressions. Without losing contact, allow the chest to fully rebound at the top of each compression. Blood pressure is created and maintained with well-performed compressions. If compressions stop, pressure is quickly lost and has to be built up again. Minimize any interruptions when doing compressions. When compressing properly, you may hear and feel changes in the chest wall. This is normal. Forceful external chest compression is critical if the person is to survive. Rescue breaths are artificial breaths given to someone who is not breathing. They are given by blowing air into the mouth to inflate the lungs. The air you breathe contains about 21% oxygen. Your exhaled air still contains up to 16 to 17% oxygen. 
this exhaled oxygen is enough to support someone's life for a short time. Before giving rescue breaths, you need to make sure there is an open airway. The airway is the only path for getting air into the lungs. Someone who is unresponsive can lose muscle tone. If flat on his back, this can cause the base of the tongue to relax and obstruct the airway. This is the most common cause of a blocked airway in an unresponsive person. The tongue is attached to the lower jaw. Moving the jaw forward lifts the tongue away from the back of the throat and opens the airway. You can open a person's airway by using the head tilt chin lift technique. Place one hand on the forehead. Place the fingertips of your other hand under the bony part of the chin. Apply firm backward pressure on the forehead while lifting the chin upward. This will tilt the head back and move the jaw forward. Maintain the head tilt with your hand on the forehead. Avoid pressing into the soft tissue of the chin with your fingers as this can also obstruct the airway. Leave the mouth slightly open. As a trained provider, you should use a protective barrier such as a CPR mask or shield when giving rescue breaths to minimize your exposure to infectious disease. Before giving rescue breaths using a mask, quickly inspect the mask to make sure the one-way valve is in place. Place the mask flat on the person's face. Use your thumb and forefinger to control the top of the mask. Use the thumb of your hand lifting the chin to control the bottom of the mask. Tilt the head and lift the chin. This brings the face up into the mask, creates an airtight seal, and opens the airway. Take a normal breath and blow through the valve opening to deliver breaths. Each breath should be one second in length and have enough air to create a visible rise of the chest, but no more. Remove your mouth and let the person exhale completely after each breath. Take a fresh breath in between delivering breaths. When giving breaths, avoid blowing too hard or too long. Air can be pushed into the stomach, making additional breaths more difficult and increasing the chance of vomiting. If you remove your hands, the airway will close again. Open the airway each time you give rescue breaths. If you cannot get the chest to rise with your first breath, reposition the head further back by using head tilt chin lift again and try another breath. To give rescue breaths using an overlay shield, begin by placing the breathing port of the shield over or into the person's mouth. Tilt the head and lift the chin to establish an open airway. Seal the nose by pinching the nostrils closed over or under the shield. Take a normal breath. Open your mouth wide and press your mouth on the shield over the person's mouth to create an airtight seal. Blow through the port to deliver the breath. Each breath should be one second in length and have enough air to create a visible rise of the chest, but no more. Remove your mouth and let the person exhale completely after each breath. Take a fresh breath in between delivering breaths. The same technique can be used to provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breaths if you elect not to use a barrier device. The primary assessment helps you assess for immediate life-threatening problems, activate the EMS system, and rapidly provide priority care. It is the same for all ages and is performed quickly. Before anything else, pause and assess the scene for hazards. If the situation is dangerous to you, do not approach. If it is safe to do so, approach the person. If he appears unresponsive, tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you okay? Use the person's name if you know it. If the person is unresponsive, have another bystander activate EMS and get an AED if one is available. If you are alone with an unresponsive adult, immediately alert EMS and get an AED yourself. Quickly return to the person. Look at the face and chest for normal breathing. Do this quickly. Normal breathing is effortless, quiet, and regular.
If normal breathing is found, place the person on his side in the recovery position. Weak, irregular gasping, snorting, or gurgling sounds can occur early in cardiac arrest. These actions provide no usable oxygen. This is not normal breathing. If someone is not breathing or only gasping, perform CPR. I need some help in here! Help! Yeah, he, he, was, he was acting kind of funny when I came in and then he, I, he, I thought he was gonna fall down and, and so I had him sit down and then he just passed out. Let me get in there. I'm trained to help. Okay, Steve? Even if a person is breathing normally, a lack of responsiveness is still considered to be a life-threatening condition that requires okay. immediate care. Call EMS and get the AED. Okay, sure. There are a variety of things that can result in unresponsiveness including medical conditions such as stroke or seizures or external factors such as alcohol or drug overdose. Regardless of the cause, the greatest treatment concern is the ability of the person to maintain a clear and open airway. Positioning an uninjured, unresponsive person in the recovery position can help maintain and protect the airway. This position uses gravity to drain fluids from the mouth and keep the tongue from blocking the airway. Anytime you have the impression someone is unconscious, act quickly. If it is safe for you to approach the person, do so. Tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you all right? If the person is unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS and get an AED. Look at the face and chest for normal breathing. This person is breathing normally. Placing her in the recovery position will protect her airway. Begin by placing the arm nearest you up alongside the head. Bring the forearm across the chest and place the back of the hand against the cheek. Grasp the far leg just above the knee and pull it up so the foot is flat on the ground. Grasping the shoulder and hip, roll the patient towards you in a single motion, keeping the head, shoulders, and torso from twisting. Make sure the head ends up resting on the extended arm and the head, neck, and torso are in line. Roll far enough for the face to be angled forward. Position the elbow and knee to help stabilize the head and body. Make sure there is no pressure on the chest that might restrict breathing. Lynn. If an unresponsive person has been seriously injured, do not move him unless you are alone and need to leave to get help. Frequently assess the breathing of anyone placed in a recovery position. The condition can quickly become worse and require additional care. Yes, yes, he is, he is breathing, someone's with him. So I think we need to push the schedule back another week. That way we have enough time to find a new supplier. Okay, sounds good. So that would be the fourth. April? April! April, it's Sarah, can you hear me? Front desk. This is Sarah, I'm in the conference room. April's collapsed. I need you to call for EMS and get me the AED. Okay. Hi, this is Jackson Publishing. Yes, one of our employees has just collapsed. When a person is unresponsive and does not appear to be breathing or is only gasping, she is considered to be in cardiac arrest and requires CPR. Once started, do the best you can. A person without breathing or circulation cannot survive. Nothing you do can make the outcome worse.
Okay, I'll pick you up on that room's extension. Hold on. Here's the AD. If it is safe for you to approach, do so. Tapper squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, Are you all right? If unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS and, if one is available, get an AED. Quickly observe the face and chest for normal breathing. If the person is not breathing or only gasping, begin CPR. Locate the proper hand position and start compressing the chest at a rate of at least 100 times per minute. After 30 compressions, tilt the head, lift the chin, and provide two rescue breaths. Quickly return to chest compressions. Without interruption, perform continuous cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Remember to compress hard and fast and allow the chest to fully rebound to its normal position after each compression. Giving effective chest compressions can be tiring. When others can help, take turns performing compressions. Switch compressors about every two minutes. Change quickly to minimize interruption. Continue CPR until an AED is ready, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. If an AED becomes available, Turn it on immediately and follow the AED's voice instructions for using it. Remove clothes from patient's chest. If you are unable or unwilling to give rescue breaths, perform compression only CPR. Without interruption, provide ongoing compressions at a rate of at least 100 times per minute until an AED is ready, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. If others are available, switch compressors about every two minutes. AEDs are designed to be simple to operate. Voice, lights, and screen instructions guide an operator in using the device. There are many different brands of AEDs, but the same basic steps for operation apply to all of them. Turn on the AED. This starts voice instructions and readies the device for use. Opening the lid will turn on the power with some AEDs. With others, a power button is pressed. Adhere the defibrillation pads to the person's bare chest. Pads are placed in specific locations to direct the electrical shock through the heart. Most pads are pre-connected to the device, but some AEDs require you to plug in a connector. Allow the AED to analyze the heart rhythm. An AED automatically starts analyzing once the pads are in place. If defibrillation is required, the AED will charge to get ready for shock delivery. Safely deliver a shock if directed to by the AED. Keeping others clear, a button is pressed on most AEDs to deliver a shock. Immediately after a shock is delivered, CPR is resumed starting with chest compressions. Voice instructions and additional analysis by the AED will guide providers through further care. Train to help. Let me see him, okay? Thank you. Sir? Are you okay? Are you okay, sir? Here. Put these on. Here's a mask. Thank you. He's not responding. 
Dom, this is Sarah. We have a guest who's just collapsed in the foyer by the fireplace. He's not responding. Can you activate the emergency for him? Understood. Okay. Grab the AD and the emergency bag. I'll call EMS. Yes, this is the Albion Hotel on 34th Street. We've had a guest collapse in our lobby. All I know is that he's unresponsive. on the white adhesive pad. Peel one white pad from the gray case. Place pad exactly as shown. Peel white pads from gray plastic case. Press pads firmly to patient's bare skin. Stay clear of patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Shock advised. Stay, Stay clear, clear of patient. Press the flashing orange Ready? button now. Ready? Here we go. Shock delivered. Start CPR again. Effective CPR, along with rapid defibrillation using an AED, provides the most effective early treatment option for sudden cardiac arrest. If it is safe for you to approach, do so. Tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you all right? If unresponsive, have a bystander activate EMS and get an AED. Quickly look at the face and chest for normal breathing. If the person is not breathing or only gasping, begin CPR. Without interruption, perform continuous cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Perform CPR until an AED is ready to analyze the heart rhythm. Position the AED close to the head. Open the case and turn on the power. Remove clothes from patient's chest. Defibrillation pads must be applied to a bare chest. If needed, quickly tear or use scissors to remove clothing, including undergarments. Remove the defibrillation pads from their packaging. The pads have pictures on them to assist in proper placement. Carefully look at the pictures to ensure the pads are accurately placed. Peel the pads from the backing sheet one at a time and place them exactly as indicated in the pictures. Place one pad below the right collarbone, above the nipple, and beside the breastbone. Make sure it adheres well by pressing it flat. Place the other pad lower on the left side over the ribs and a few inches below the armpit. Again, press firmly. AEDs automatically start analyzing once the pads are in place. Analyzing heart rhythm. Movement can interrupt the analysis. Be certain that no one is touching the person. 
If defibrillation is required, an AED will charge to deliver a shock. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Give a verbal warning and look to make sure no one, including you, is in contact with the person before delivering the shock. Immediately after delivering the shock, resume CPR starting with chest compressions. If the person responds, stop CPR and place him in a recovery position. Leave the AED on and attached in case cardiac arrest returns. When a shock is not indicated by the AED, no shock advised. Simply resume CPR, starting with chest compressions, and continue to follow any voice instructions. Don't stop until the person shows signs of life, another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too exhausted to continue. AEDs are designed to detect problems during use and guide you through corrective actions. If a troubleshooting message occurs, stay calm and follow the AED's voice instructions. If the AED indicates a problem with the pads, the pads are not completely adhered to the skin or there is a poor connection to the AED. Press pads firmly, especially in the center, to make sure they are adhering well. Make sure the pad's cable connector is firmly connected to the AED. If the chest is wet, remove pads and wipe the chest dry. Apply a new set of pads. If pads do not stick due to chest hair, pull the pads off and quickly shave the hair. Attach another set of pads. Another troubleshooting message may indicate that analysis has been interrupted due to movement. Stop all sources of movement, such as chest compressions or rescue breaths. If a message indicates the need to replace a battery, there may only be enough energy for a limited number of shocks. If the AED fails to operate, the depleted battery should be removed and replaced with a new one. A person should be removed from standing water before using an AED. It is okay to use an AED when a person is lying on a wet surface, such as in the rain or near a swimming pool. An AED should never be immersed in water or have fluids spilled on it. AEDs can also be used safely on metal surfaces, such as gratings or stairwells. Make sure pads do not directly touch any metal surface. Someone may have a surgically implanted device in the chest, such as a pacemaker or an automated internal defibrillator. A noticeable lump and surgical scar will be visible. If the implanted device is in the way of correct pad placement, place the pads so the edges are at least one inch away from the device. Defibrillating over medication patches could reduce the effectiveness of the shock. If a medication patch is interfering with placement, Use a gloved hand to peel off the patch and wipe away any remaining residue before placing pads. Choking can occur when a solid object, such as a piece of food or small object, enters a narrowed part of the airway and becomes stuck. On inhalation, the object can be drawn tighter into the airway and block air from entering the lungs. A forceful thrust beneath the ribs and up into the diaphragm can compress the air in the chest and pop the object out of the airway. Direct compression of the chest over the breastbone can also create enough pressure to expel an object. You must be able to recognize the difference between a mild blockage and a severe blockage. With a mild blockage, a person can speak, cough, or gag. This type of blockage is typically cleared by coughing. Encourage someone with a mild blockage to cough forcibly. Stay close and be ready to take action if things worsen. When a severe blockage occurs, a person cannot dislodge the object on his own. Signs of severe obstruction include very little or no air exchange, lack of sound, and the inability to speak or cough forcefully. The person may hold his hands to his throat as he attempts to clear an obstruction naturally.
Your help is required to save the person's life. To care for someone who you suspect is choking, begin by asking, Are you choking? If the person nods yes or is unable to speak, cough, or cry, act quickly. Stand behind the person. Reach around and locate the person's navel with your finger. Make a fist and place the thumb side against the abdomen, just above your finger and below the ribs. Grasp your fist with your other hand. Give a quick inward and upward thrust. Repeat thrusts. Each thrust needs to be given with the intent of expelling the object. Repeat thrusts until the person can breathe normally. If the person becomes unresponsive, carefully lower her to the ground. If not already done, activate EMS. Begin CPR, starting with compressions. Look in the mouth for an object after each set of compressions before giving rescue breaths. Remove any object if seen. Continue until the person shows obvious signs of life or another provider or EMS personnel take over. When someone is clearly pregnant or obese, use chest thrusts instead of abdominal thrusts. Position yourself directly behind the person. Reach under the armpits and place the thumb side of your fist on the center of the chest. Grasp your fist with the other hand and thrust straight backward. Try to not put pressure on the ribs. If you are alone, try pressing your abdomen quickly against a rigid surface, such as the back of a chair. If one is not available, attempt abdominal thrusts on yourself. Abdominal and chest thrusts can cause internal injury. Anyone who has been treated for choking with these maneuvers should be evaluated by EMS or a physician to ensure there were no injuries. Just as with an unresponsive person, the primary assessment for someone who is responsive is to assess for and immediately treat life-threatening problems, including bleeding and shock. If it is safe for you to approach, do so. Introduce yourself. Let the person know you are first aid trained and there to help. Check for a diminished level of responsiveness. Assess for any difficulty in breathing. Scan the body for serious bleeding. If found, control it immediately. Check the face for tissue color. Assess the palms of the hands, fingernails, or inside of the lip of a dark-skinned person. Tissue color depends on the amount of blood circulating below the skin. Normal tissue color is light pink. Paleness can indicate blood loss or shock. A bluish color can indicate a lack of oxygen. Assess skin temperature by touching the forehead with your bare wrist. Normal skin feels warm and dry. Cool, wet skin can be an indication of shock. Quickly activate EMS and provide any primary care when a life-threatening medical condition is found or suspected. When a primary assessment indicates no life-threatening problems, complete a secondary assessment to gather additional information. Quickly try to determine the person's chief complaint. Ask him what happened. If he cannot answer, ask bystanders. The person may have a medical alert bracelet or necklace identifying a medical condition that could be related to the current problem. The mechanism or forces that caused an injury may help predict the presence of a hidden injury. Clues in the environment such as the temperature, or the presence of medications or containers, may help identify the cause of the chief complaint. Physically assess the person. Briefly assess the body from head to toe. Look and feel for signs of illness and injury. The DOTS acronym helps to remind you what to look for. Deformities, open injuries, tenderness, swelling. If needed, Remove or cut away clothing to get a better look at an affected body part. If at any time you suspect spinal injury, immediately provide spinal motion restriction by manually stabilizing the head. Ask questions. Use the acronym SAMPLE, S-A-M-P-L-E, -E, to help you remember what to ask about. Things the person is feeling, such as pain, nausea, 
dizziness, or anything related to the situation. Things the person may be allergic to. Medications the person has been prescribed or is taking. Medical problems that may be related to what is going on. When the person last ate or drank. What the person was doing just prior to the problem. If you find or begin to suspect a life-threatening problem is occurring while performing a secondary assessment, stop, quickly activate EMS, and provide the primary care. When's the next shipment getting in? Any time. That's why we need to get this done as quick as we can. Ah, nuts! I cut myself. Blood vessels are present throughout the body. Bleeding occurs when tissues are damaged. Heavy bleeding is likely if a major blood vessel is damaged. Kenny, I need the first aid kit! Bleeding reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. If heavy or uncontrolled, bleeding can quickly become life-threatening. Arterial bleeding is bright red and will often spurt from a wound. It can be difficult to control due to the pressure created by the heart's contractions. If the blood is dark red and flowing steadily, it is likely coming from a damaged vein. Bleeding from a vein can be heavy. Regardless of the source, all heavy bleeding must be controlled as soon as possible. Clot-forming fibers naturally collect at a wound site to create a patch to stop bleeding. Severe bleeding can overwhelm this process and prevent clotting from occurring. Activate EMS immediately for any heavy bleeding. Go call EMS. Okay. Bleeding exposes you, the provider, to potentially infectious body fluids. Always use protective barriers such as disposable gloves to protect both you and the injured person. Okay, I'm going to have you move your hand, and then I'm going to put the pressure on with this, okay? Okay. Continuous firm and direct pressure applied to a wound is the best method for controlling external bleeding. Quickly expose and inspect the wound. Using a clean, absorbent pad or dressing, apply direct pressure with the flat parts of your fingers, directly on the point of bleeding. If a pad is not available, apply direct pressure with just your gloved hand. If blood soaks through the pad, apply another pad, leaving the initial pad in place. Apply more pressure with the palm of your hand. Apply a pressure bandage to provide continuous pressure to the wound. Wrap a roller gauze or elastic bandage around the injury with enough pressure to maintain bleeding control. Avoid wrapping the bandage so tightly that the skin beyond the bandage becomes cool to the touch, bluish or numb. Make sure a finger can be slipped under the bandage once it is applied. When barriers are not available, an injured person can provide self-care or a provider can use improvised barriers, such as a plastic bag. Jason, are you all right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I didn't see you coming. Are you hurting? No. <laughs> More surprised than anything else. A significant blow can create injury and bleeding inside the body. This is especially true for organs in the chest and abdomen. Internal bleeding can be difficult to detect. Suspect it if the chest or abdomen is hit hard. Signs of shock may be the earliest indication that internal bleeding is occurring. Shock develops when poor blood flow creates a shortage of oxygen to body tissues. Any serious illness or injury has the potential to cause shock. If not treated early, it can get worse and become life-threatening. Shock is progressive in nature. Early signs can be difficult to detect. A person may simply appear uneasy, restless, or worried. Other more serious signs can emerge gradually over time. 
Responsiveness may diminish. The skin may become pale, cool, and sweaty. A person in shock must get to a hospital as quickly as possible in order to survive. Early recognition, treatment, and activation of EMS are essential for survival. To limit the effects of shock, help the body maintain adequate oxygen by ensuring an open and clear airway, ensuring normal breathing, and controlling any external bleeding. If there is no difficulty in breathing, lay the person flat on the ground. Maintain a normal body temperature. Insulate on top and underneath to prevent heat loss. Be careful not to overheat. Give nothing to eat or drink, even if the person asks for it. Keep the person as comfortable and calm as possible. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. When the body suffers a significant force, such as from a high fall, shooting, or motor vehicle crash, serious injury can result, most notably to the spine. Injury to the spinal cord can result in temporary or permanent paralysis or in a life-threatening condition such as the loss of breathing. After the initial injury, movement of the damaged spinal bones can result in additional injury to the spinal cord or surrounding tissue. This can result in permanent damage. Always make sure it is safe to provide care. Quickly instruct a responsive person to remain still. Ask about how the injury occurred. Look for any obvious injury to the head, neck, or back. Ask about numbness, tingling, burning, or loss of sensation in the arms or legs. The lack of obvious injury does not mean that the spine is not injured. If a significant mechanism of injury occurred, it is best to assume a spinal injury exists. The priority of care is to help prevent further injury by keeping the injured person still and using spinal motion restriction. Activate EMS. Comfort, calm, and reassure the person. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. To perform spinal motion restriction, get into a comfortable position behind the person. Cup your hands on both sides of the head without covering the ears to manually stabilize it. Minimize any motion of head, neck, and back. Establishing an airway for an unresponsive person is a higher priority than protecting suspected injury to the spine. Tilt the head and lift the chin when it is necessary to maintain an open airway or give rescue breaths. If you need to leave an unresponsive person with a suspected spinal injury alone to get help, place the person in a recovery position to protect the airway before you go. Hey! Hey! I need some help out here! You fell! A significant blow or force to the head can result in internal injury to the brain and soft tissues within the skull. Swelling or bleeding from the injury can cause increasing pressure within the skull and damage to the delicate brain tissue. Surgical intervention may be the only treatment. Activate EMS immediately and provide spinal motion restriction. Do not try to stop the flow of blood or fluid from the ears or nose. If the person has a seizure, maintain spinal motion restriction and protect her from bumping into nearby objects. Do not restrain her tightly and do not place anything in her mouth. Seizures generally last for just a few minutes. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. Bones, muscles, and joints give the body shape, allow movement, and protect vital internal organs. Long bones form the upper and lower parts of each limb. Muscles, ligaments, and tendons attach to the bones, allowing for movement where the bones come together at joints. 
These bones are the most exposed to external forces and injury. There are four different types of injuries affecting bones, muscles, and joints. Strains are stretching or tearing injuries to muscles or tendons. Sprains are tearing injuries to ligaments that hold joints together. Dislocations are the separation of bone ends at a joint. Fractures are breaks in bones. Common signs of these injuries include swelling, pain, and discoloration. Distinguishing an injury to muscle or bone is often difficult. It is best to treat them all as possible fractures. Somebody, I need some help. I'm in the stairwell. The limb may appear deformed, and the person may be guarding it by holding it against his body. What's wrong? My, my shoulder. I felt it pop. It's bad. Okay, we can help, just hold it still. Josh. Unstable bones or joints can damage tissue, muscle, blood vessels, and nerves when moved. Just hold it still. The immediate treatment is to minimize movement and prevent additional injury. If the injury seems serious or you are not sure, activate EMS as early as possible. Encourage the person to not use the injured limb. Movement can cause further injury. An open wound may be present in association with a fracture. If needed, expose the injury site by gently cutting or tearing away clothing. Cover an open wound with a clean, absorbent pad and gently control bleeding with firm, continuous, direct pressure around the bone or injury site. Never push a bone back under the skin. Leave the injured limb in the position it was found. Use padding in the gaps and holes underneath it to provide a stable and comfortable spot for the limb to rest. If needed, place your hands above and below the injured area to help immobilize the limb. For many injuries, local cooling can help decrease bleeding, swelling, and pain. A plastic bag filled with a mixture of ice and water works best. Place a thin cloth between the bag and skin to prevent cold-related problems. Limit application to 20 minutes or less. Comfort, calm, and reassure the person. Reassess the person and the injury regularly until EMS arrives. Splinting an injured limb can reduce pain and prevent further injury. In general, it is best to rely on EMS personnel to splint, as they have more extensive training, experience, and equipment. Burns can inflict serious physical damage to the body, typically caused by close exposure to high temperatures, chemical reactions, or electrical current, burns can vary in severity. The larger the surface area burned, the greater the disruption of the skin's ability to properly maintain body temperature. The deeper a burn goes into the skin and underlying tissue, the more likely the risk of infection. Burns involving the face, hands, genitals, and feet can result in the limitation of basic functions, such as movement and sensation. Devin! Devin! Get on the ground and roll on it! Minor burns include those that involve the outer layer of the skin and result in redness and pain. These include small burns that extend into the deeper layers of the skin and cause some blistering. Cool the burn with cool water as soon as possible. Continue cooling until the pain is relieved. This will reduce pain, swelling, and the depth of injury. Leave any blisters intact. Cover the burn with a loose, sterile pad. Minor burns usually heal without further treatment. Deep burns over a large area of the body are the most severe. 
These burns often result in extensive blistering and destruction of skin tissue. Make sure the situation is safe for you to help. Activate EMS immediately. Expose the affected area by cutting or tearing away clothing. If any clothing is stuck to the burn, do not remove it. If present, remove any jewelry near the burned area. Separate fingers or toes with dry, sterile, non-adhesive dressings. Do not apply butter, ointment, lotion, or antiseptic. Loosely cover the burn area with a dry, clean pad or clean sheet. Give the person nothing to eat or drink. While awaiting EMS, monitor the airway for swelling from inhalation of smoke or hot gases. I can't get it. Here, let me try. Ah! Some chemicals can react and damage skin tissue on contact. The immediate care is to dilute and remove the chemical quickly to minimize the damage. Remove any contaminated clothing. Flood the affected area with large amounts of water, unless the chemical is known to react with water. Continue to flush with water until the burning sensation stops. Cover any visible burns loosely with a dry, clean pad and seek further medical attention. When involved, brush off any dry powder with a gloved hand or cloth prior to flushing. Hey honey, can you give me a hand for a second? This washer's leaking. I need help moving the dryer. Electrical burns are caused by contact with electrical wires, current, or lightning. Be safe. Turn the power off before touching the affected person. If you cannot make it safe, do not attempt care. An electric shock can cause an abnormal heart rhythm in which the heart stops. Perform CPR until an AED is ready another provider or EMS personnel take over, or you are too tired to continue. Medical conditions and illnesses can suddenly trigger an unexpected medical emergency. In general, suspect a serious illness when, without warning, a person suddenly appears weak, ill, or in severe pain. In many cases, the human body displays warning signs to alert us to serious illness. The most common warning signs of serious illness are altered mental status, breathing difficulty or shortness of breath, pain, severe pressure, or discomfort in the chest, and severe abdominal pain. Caused by a number of medical conditions, an altered mental status is a significant or unusual change in a person's personality, behavior, or consciousness. It is an indication of a change in brain function. Hey Mike, heard you're looking for me. Mike? Mike, are you okay? Mike? Mike, it's Scott. Do you understand me? Regardless of the cause, an altered mental status is a warning sign of a serious problem and is considered a medical emergency. Hey, Todd! Can you come here, please? Just relax. We're gonna take care of you. What's up? He's confused. I'm not sure what it is. Can you please call EMS? Sure. Activate EMS. Position the person for comfort. Calm and reassure the person as best you can. 
If the person's level of responsiveness is or becomes severely diminished, consider placing the person in a recovery position to protect the airway. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Here you are. Thank you. Anne. Anne, what happened? What's the matter? C can you hear me, Anne? Hi, my name's Andy. I'm trained in first aid, can I help? I don't know what's going on. She's just not responding. Can you understand me? Okay. A stroke or brain attack occurs when the blood supply to a portion of the brain is suddenly interrupted. This most commonly occurs when a blood clot gets caught in a blood vessel. A stroke can also occur when a weak spot in the wall of a blood vessel, known as an aneurysm, bursts open and bleeds into the surrounding brain tissue. In both cases, brain cells die. Signs of a stroke can vary. They tend to show up suddenly. Numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body, may be present. A person may appear confused. A change in the ability to speak or understand can occur sight and balance can be affected, and a severe, sudden headache may be described. A quick method to determine if someone could be suffering from a stroke is to ask the person to smile, to hold up both arms, and to speak a simple sentence. If the person has trouble with any of these tasks, a stroke may have occurred. Do you have a cell phone? Yes, I do. Can you call 911? Sure. A stroke is a true medical emergency. Activate EMS immediately if a stroke is suspected. Rapid treatment in a hospital is critical in limiting the damage that can occur. A person experiencing a stroke can become frustrated at being unable to move or communicate clearly. The person may appear confused but still be aware of what is happening. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Do not give anything to eat or drink. Scott? Scott? Are you okay? Scott, what's wrong? I came to have lunch with Scott and something's wrong. Okay. Let me see if I can help. Scott? It's Nina. We're worried about you. Can I help? Nina? Hi. Scott, do you know what's happening? Diabetes is a disease in which the body cannot effectively use sugar for energy. Suspect the possibility of a diabetic emergency with anyone who has a gradual change in mental status. The skin may be pale, cool, and sweaty. You may also notice a sweet or fruity smell in the person's breath. If a person is diabetic, there may be evidence of the condition. Ask others about the person's medical history or medications he may be taking. Look for a medical alert bracelet or necklace identifying the condition. His bracelet says that he's diabetic. Go to the refrigerator in the break room and get some juice. Okay. If you know the person is diabetic, determine his level of response and ability to swallow. If the person is responsive and able to swallow without difficulty, give sweet juice, candy, or any sweet substance containing sugar. If the person has oral glucose gel, use that instead. Do not use anything with an artificial sweetener. If the person has a diminished level of responsiveness and has difficulty swallowing, activate EMS. Do not give anything to eat or drink. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person. If he responds to the sugar, his mental status will gradually improve. If there is no response to sugar within about 15 minutes or the condition worsens, activate EMS. It is important to note that insulin is not considered an emergency medication. It is never appropriate to administer insulin to a diabetic person in an emergency setting. 
Jack. Jack, what's wrong? Seizures are triggered by excessive electrical activity within the brain. The result is uncontrolled muscle convulsions throughout the body. Generally, seizures happen without warning. Jerking movements of the body occur and breathing may seem absent. The person can lose control of his bowel or bladder and may vomit. While there are many things that can cause a seizure to occur, the care provided is always the same. Protect the person during the seizure. Move objects away that he may bump into. Do not restrain the person. Allow the seizure to take its course. Do not put anything in the mouth, including your finger. There is no danger of the tongue being swallowed. Activate EMS if the person is injured during the seizure, has no history of seizure, or continues to seize for more than 10 minutes. Most seizures last only a short time and stop without any special treatment. If response and breathing are absent after a seizure stops, begin CPR and get an AED if one is available. Once a seizure stops, it is normal for responsiveness to improve slowly over time. Provide continual reassurance as the person improves. Provide privacy to minimize embarrassment. Continue to monitor until the person returns to normal. Breathing difficulty or shortness of breath is a medical emergency. It is generally caused by an underlying medical illness such as asthma, allergic reaction, heart failure, or lung disease. Todd, what's going on? Can't catch my breath. At rest, normal breathing is regular and effortless. You may first suspect difficulty when there is a noticeable increase in the effort to breathe and the rate at which breaths are occurring. Unusual breathing sounds may occur. A bluish purple tissue color, especially in the lips or fingers, indicates a developing lack of oxygen and is a serious sign. No, can you come here? We're gonna get you some help. Do not wait to see if a person's condition will improve. Activate EMS without delay. If an AED is available, have someone get it. Allow the person to find the most comfortable position in which to breathe. Loosen any tight clothing. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Breathing difficulty can quickly become life-threatening as a person becomes exhausted from the breathing effort. Be prepared to provide CPR and attach an AED if the person's condition worsens. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. Asthma, or reactive airway disease, affects the small air passages in the lungs. Irritants can trigger a reaction that results in narrowed passages due to swelling and the production of mucus. Airflow into and out of the lungs is restricted. Asthma symptoms can vary from mild to life-threatening. Quick relief medications that work fast to control asthma symptoms are available. If the person has a prescribed inhaler for asthma, assist her in using it. If the person does not improve within 15 to 20 minutes, activate EMS. A severe allergic reaction, or anaphylaxis, is an extreme response of the body's immune system to something it is very sensitive to. Common things that can initiate a severe reaction include bee stings, peanuts, latex, and penicillin. When anaphylaxis occurs, the airway becomes constricted due to swelling of the throat, making it difficult to breathe. Wheezing may be heard. Swelling of the lips, eyelids, and face may occur. Itchy, raised lumps or hives can appear on the face and chest. The person may complain of nausea and abdominal cramping. A reaction can develop rapidly. In general, the faster the reaction occurs, the more severe it is. 
Without treatment, death can occur within 15 minutes. Activate EMS. Allow the person to find the most comfortable position in which to breathe. Loosen any tight clothing. A person with a history of allergic reactions may carry a prescribed epinephrine auto-injector. Epinephrine can quickly reverse the effects of the reaction and may be life-saving. If the person has an auto-injector available, assist him in using it on himself. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Hey, Don. Hey, Adam, can you come here? Don, what's up? Are you doing okay? Chest. Acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, occurs when there is reduced blood flow to the tissues of the heart. Often described as a heart attack, ACS is a serious condition that can result in significant damage to the heart. Someone with ACS will generally experience pain, severe pressure, or discomfort in the chest. Women often do not experience these signs and will describe indigestion, weakness, or fatigue. Shortness of breath, nausea, and lightheadedness can also occur. The person's skin may be pale, cool, and sweaty. A person who has had previous heart problems is at risk for reoccurrence. Ask the person or any bystanders about prior problems or medications being taken. Activate EMS immediately, even if the person does not want you to. If an AED is available, have someone get it and keep it nearby. Do not try to transport the person to a hospital yourself. Allow the person to find the most comfortable position in which to breathe. Loosen tight clothing. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person. A person who is having a heart attack may deny it. This is a common occurrence in ACS. Accept it, but never let this alter your approach to care. Someone with a heart condition may carry a prescribed medication known as nitroglycerin assist the person in taking it. Aspirin can be life-saving for a person having a heart attack. While waiting for EMS providers to arrive, encourage the person to chew one non-coated adult or two low-dose baby aspirin. However, do not encourage aspirin use if the person has an allergy to aspirin, evidence of a stroke, or a recent bleeding problem. Whenever a heart attack is suspected, be prepared for the possibility of sudden cardiac arrest and the need for CPR and the use of an AED. Continue to reassure the person until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Looks like our baggage didn't make the connecting flight. How are you doing? Oh, slow. It's really starting to hurt. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Melissa, are you okay? No. Severe abdominal pain can be a warning sign of serious illness, especially if it appears suddenly or is a new experience for the patient. Call for help. Uh, there's phones over by the restroom. Sure, I'll be right back. There are a number of important organs in the abdomen. Depending on the body systems involved, many serious problems can occur and cause pain. Early recognition and rapid transport to a hospital may help to prevent the development of a life-threatening condition. A person complaining of severe abdominal pain will typically try to find a position of comfort to relieve the pain. The abdomen may be rigid and tender to the touch. The person may become nauseated and vomit. The person may describe a recent blunt blow to the abdomen or may be pregnant. Activate EMS. 
allow the person to find the most comfortable position possible. Reassure the person and keep her as calm as possible. Do not give anything to eat or drink. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Ate some of the medicine you give to Betsy. When? Just now. I saw him in the tack room with a spoon. I told him to stop. Any substance that can enter the body and create a harmful disturbance or reaction in the body can be described as a poison. Mitchell, honey, what have you eaten? By far, poisoning most often occurs by ingestion. Children under six years old account for over half of all poisonings. You stay here with Savannah. I'll be outside making a phone call. Most poisoning deaths in children are accidental, while most deaths in adults are intentional. Common ingested poisons include pain medications, personal care products, and household cleaning products. The effects of ingested poisons are wide-ranging and often resemble those of common illnesses. Abdominal pain or cramping, nausea and vomiting may occur, a person may also have an altered mental status. Often, the ingestion is described by the person. Open and empty containers, unusual smells, and odd staining on clothes, skin, or lips may be present. If you suspect a person has ingested something poisonous, act quickly. Activate EMS if the person is displaying any serious signs or symptoms. In the United States, calling the National Poison Help Hotline at 1-800-222-1222 automatically transfers you to a regional poison control center. Poison centers can quickly provide information regarding the immediate treatment of any substance. You can help EMS providers and the poison center by clearly identifying the substance and providing details about the incident. Save any vomit, bottles, or containers for EMS. Do not induce vomiting or give water, milk, activated charcoal, or syrup of Ipecac to the person unless you were advised to do so by the Poison Control Center or EMS. Keep the person still, calm, comfort, and reassure. Reassess the person regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Inhaled poisoning occurs when a harmful substance is breathed in. Common inhaled poisons include carbon monoxide from smoke or engine exhaust, natural gas, solvent fumes, and chemical vapors. Ricky, are you in here? Yeah. A person may complain of a headache nausea, dizziness, and difficulty breathing. An altered mental status can occur. That's making my eyes water. I think one of the cans got busted. <coughs> I've been trying to find it. Ricky, you need to get out of here. Come on. Yeah, okay. Suspect inhaled poisoning whenever someone is working in an enclosed space and he is feeling ill. Make sure it is safe for you to help. If you can do so without risk to yourself, immediately move the person to fresh air. Try to catch your breath. <laughs> Allow the person to find a comfortable position. I'm feeling a little dizzy. <coughs> it's hard to breathe still. Activate EMS if the person is displaying any serious signs or symptoms. Ricky, do you know exactly what it was that spilled down there? I think so. Okay. Call the U.S. <laughs> National Poison Hotline at 1-800-222-1222 for additional directions on care. Help identify the substance and provide details about the incident. Yes, he inhaled the chemicals. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over.
heat-related problems occur when the body's normal temperature-reducing mechanisms get overwhelmed, especially during vigorous physical activity, and become inefficient or stop working. An active body creates heat. Hey, are you okay? When it is exposed to hot, humid temperatures, sweating occurs to evaporate and cool the body. Heat exhaustion can develop from the combination of an increased internal temperature and the excessive loss of fluids to the environment, typically from sweating. Signs include heavy sweating and pale, cool skin. The person may become nauseated and vomit. He may complain of a headache or dizziness and feel weak. Although it may not appear serious, treat suspected heat exhaustion without delay. Without immediate treatment, it could progress to heat stroke, a life-threatening condition. Stop the person from activity and move him to a cooler place. Loosen or remove excess clothing. Have the person lie down and raise the legs 6 to 12 inches. Spray water or apply cool, wet cloths to head and torso. Use a fan to speed evaporation. Encourage the person to drink cool fluids, preferably a sports drink with carbohydrates and electrolytes. If the person does not improve or seems to get worse, activate EMS. Hey, Jim, are you all right? What's wrong? I'm going to get you out of here. Heat stroke is a true life-threatening medical emergency. It can occur due to overexertion in a hot, humid environment or as the result of a breakdown in the body's ability to shed heat. If body temperature rises significantly, it can quickly cause permanent damage to sensitive organs, including the brain and spinal cord. In addition to the signs of heat exhaustion, a person with heat stroke will have an altered mental status. The skin can become red, very warm or even hot, and be completely dry. What's going on here? Hey, he's badly overheated. Can you go get him some water and ice or anything else to help cool him down? Hurry. Heavy sweating could be present, especially when exertion is the cause. The person may collapse and have a seizure. Activate EMS immediately. I'm at the Springfield Mill. Uh, an employee here has just collapsed. Uh, Begin aggressive cooling with the resources available to you. Spray or pour water on the victim and fan him. Apply ice packs to the person's neck, groin, and armpits. Cover the victim with a wet sheet. The best method, when possible, is to immerse the person in cool water up to his neck. Provide continuous cooling until EMS arrives. With early recognition and immediate cooling, the survival rate approaches 90 percent. Cold, wet temperatures can result in a lowering of the internal body temperature. Hypothermia and frostbite are the most dangerous cold-related conditions. John. John, stop! Stop, he's waving. Hi. How's it going? Uh, my car's stalled. I've been out here a long time. Okay. Hypothermia, a generalized cooling of the body, occurs when the internal core body temperature has decreased to 95 degrees Fahrenheit or less. It is a life-threatening condition. body processes become impaired and eventually fail. To help recognize hypothermia, look for signs such as pale, cold skin, uncontrollable shivering, loss of coordination, difficulty speaking, and an altered mental status. Severe hypothermia can result in the loss of shivering and a slowing of the breathing and heart rate. To care for the person, carefully and gently move him to a warmer place.
Remove wet clothing and cover him with something dry and warm. Cover his head and neck to retain body heat. If available, activate EMS and get an AED if one is available. Be prepared to perform CPR and use the AED. If you are far from professional medical care, begin actively rewarming the person. Remove wet clothing. Place him near a heat source. Containers of warm but not hot water in contact with the person's skin. It is best to recognize and treat hypothermia early. The chance for survival decreases as the condition progresses. Frostbite develops when skin freezes. Body parts that are exposed to extreme cold, such as fingers, toes, earlobes, cheeks, and nose, are the most likely to be affected. Early signs of developing frostbite include a pins and needles sensation and throbbing. Minor frostbite can be treated with simple rewarming using skin-to-skin -skin contact such as a warm hand. Later signs include a loss of feeling in the affected part and firm, pale, cold, numb skin. If you suspect frostbite, quickly get the person to a warmer place. Remove wet clothing. When EMS is available or there is any chance that the part may refreeze, do not try to rewarm the frostbitten area. Remove any jewelry from the affected areas. Place clean pads between frostbitten fingers and toes. Wrap the affected part with a clean towel or pad. Do not rub or massage the affected area or disturb blisters on frostbitten skin. If you are far from professional medical care and there is no chance refreezing will occur, rewarm the affected part yourself. Immerse the frostbitten area in warm water for 20 to 30 minutes. The water should be warm, not hot, just above normal body temperature. Check and maintain the water temperature often. Severe burning pain, swelling, blistering, and color changes may occur. Do not use chemical warmers directly on frostbitten tissue because they can cause burns. Do not let the person use the affected part after it is thawed. Get him to professional medical care as soon as you are able to. It is best not to move an ill or injured person unless he is clearly endangered or he requires life-supporting care. The greatest concern in moving a seriously injured person is the chance of making a spinal injury worse. If you decide it is necessary to move someone, the most effective move to use is a drag. When using a drag, pull in the direction of the long axis of the body to keep the spine in line. Never pull on a person's head or pull a person's body sideways. Common drags include the extremity drag, performed by grasping and pulling on the ankles or forearms. The clothing drag, performed by pulling on a person's shirt in the neck and shoulder area. And the blanket drag, performed by rolling a person onto a blanket and dragging the blanket. When moving someone, use your legs, not your back, and keep him as close to your body as possible. Avoid twisting. Vehicle fires and traffic crashes are relatively rare. Bystanders have dragged injured people from vehicles in the mistaken belief that the vehicle will catch fire and explode. Moving a person when it is not necessary can make injuries worse. Avoid moving an injured person from a damaged vehicle unless you believe his or her life is clearly in danger. Caring for someone in an emergency can create emotional distress. More serious problems or relationships with those involved can intensify these feelings. 
Common reactions include anxiety, trembling or shaking, sweating, nausea, fast breathing, and pounding heartbeat. This is a normal human reaction to a traumatic event. Simply remember to stay calm and accept your limitations as a provider. When an emergency is over, a provider is often left alone while an ill or injured person is transported away by EMS. With little time for closure, you can begin to experience a variety of reactions. These include feeling abandoned or helpless, recalling the event over and over, self-doubt about not doing enough, difficulty concentrating, heaviness in the chest, upset stomach or diarrhea, and difficulty sleeping or nightmares. It is important to understand that these feelings are normal and should pass with time. However, there are actions you can take to help cope with and work through the difficulty. Informally speak to someone you trust to listen without judgment, such as a family member, friend, or coworker. Get back to a normal routine as soon as possible. Accept that it will take time to resolve these emotions. If unpleasant feelings persist, formal assistance from a professional counselor may be helpful as you work through your emotions about the event. When direct pressure is not possible or not effective at controlling heavy bleeding from a limb, apply a tourniquet as a last resort. Proper training to use a tourniquet is important. Incorrect application can result in serious injury or loss of limb. Commercial tourniquets have been found to be safer and more reliable than improvised ones. Always follow the manufacturer's directions for use when using a commercial tourniquet. Practice using the tourniquet as part of your training. Loop the self-adhering band around the injured limb. Place the band at least two inches above the wound site and not over a joint. Pull the self-adhering band tight and securely fasten the band back on itself. Twist the windlass rod until bleeding stops. Lock the rod with the windlass clip. Document the time of application. Unless directed by qualified medical personnel, do not remove or loosen a tourniquet once it is applied. To improvise a tourniquet using a triangular bandage, fold the bandage lengthwise so that it is approximately 2 inches wide. Place the center of the bandage at least 2 inches above the wound site and not over a joint. Wrap the bandage tightly around the limb, bringing both ends back to the top, keeping the material as flat as possible. Tie a half knot over the top of the bandage and place a rigid stick-like object on top of the half knot. Tie a full knot over the top of the object.
twist the object until the bleeding stops. Secure the stick so it does not loosen or unwind. Document the time of application. Unless directed by qualified medical personnel, do not remove or loosen a tourniquet once it is applied. A splint is a device used to externally immobilize a painful, swollen, or deformed limb in order to decrease pain and prevent further injury. In most cases, splinting an injured body part is best accomplished by EMS. In cases where EMS response is significantly delayed or not available, it is appropriate for you to splint an injured limb. Splints can be improvised with commonly available items. Something rigid to provide external stability, things such as another part of the body, compressed pillow, cardboard, folded magazine, and wood slat. Something soft to fill and support the contoured gaps around joints and bony ridges, things such as pads, towels, coats, pillows, and blankets. Something to bind the limb, rigid material, and padding together. Things such as roller bandage, folded cloth bandages, tape, belts, and rope. Commercial splints are available to make splinting more convenient. This includes cardboard splints, padded board splints, and the SAM splint, a padded, malleable aluminum material that is easy to store and can be molded and shaped to create rigid splinting material. The basic rules to follow when splinting are splint the limb in the position found. In addition to immobilizing the injury site, immobilize the joints above and below the injury. After splinting, check frequently for discoloration coolness or numbness past the splint. If necessary, loosen the splint to improve blood flow. Before applying a splint, make sure there are no higher priority problems to care for. Expose the injured limb to see if there are any open wounds. Provide manual stabilization until the splint is applied. Locate and gather the splinting materials you will use. Place padding on the rigid material where tapered surfaces of the limb, like around joints, will be placed. Place the rigid material alongside or underneath the injured limb, making sure it extends beyond the joints above and below. Bind the rigid material firmly to the limb. Do not bind the limb over the injury site. Wrap both sides of a joint to immobilize the joint. Allow the hand or foot to assume a natural position. Secure the material tightly enough to provide immobilization, but not tight enough to restrict blood circulation. When a joint cannot be immobilized with the rigid material, you can immobilize it against another body part, such as using a sling and swath wrap to immobilize the elbow to the torso. Once a splint is in place, Observe the limb on the far side of the splint for signs of poor blood circulation. If the limb is cool or numb, loosen the binding on the splint to improve blood flow. A meter dose inhaler is a device used to deliver a specific amount of medicine. To use a metered dose inhaler, remove the cap on the mouth port and shake the inhaler. Have the user hold the inhaler upright. Tilt her head back slightly and breathe out. Instruct the user to place the port of the inhaler into her mouth. Tell her to press down on the inhaler canister to release the medication. Breathe in slowly for 3 to 5 seconds and then let go of the canister. If possible, have her hold her breath for 10 seconds to help the medicine get deeply into the lungs. Repeat as directed by the dosage instructions on the medicine canister.
A nebulizer is a device that uses compressed air to turn liquid medicine into a mist for inhaling. To use a nebulizer, place the air compressor on a sturdy surface. Pour the medication into the nebulizer cup. Assemble the nebulizer cup and mouthpiece. Connect one end of the tubing to the air compressor and the other to the nebulizer cup. Turn on the air compressor. Have the person place the mouthpiece in her mouth and take a slow, deep breath. Instruct the person, if possible, to hold her breath for two to three seconds to help the medicine get deeply into the lungs. Continue breaths until the nebulizer cup is empty. It is critical for anyone with a history of anaphylaxis to keep an epinephrine auto-injector that has been prescribed by a physician on hand at all times. An auto-injector uses a spring-loaded needle to rapidly administer a measured single dose of epinephrine. It is easy to use with minimal training. When a person is unable to self-administer an injection, you may be able to do it for him. Your state law must allow for you to do so, and proper training is generally required to meet the regulation. The EpiPen epinephrine auto-injector is a commonly used delivery device. Available in both adult and child dosages, the EpiPen is designed to work through clothing. To use, remove the EpiPen from its storage container. Never put your thumb, fingers, or hand over the orange tip. Form a fist around the injector and pull off the blue safety release cap. Position the EpiPen near the person's outer thigh. Swing and firmly push the orange tip against the thigh so it clicks. Hold the injector firmly on the thigh for approximately 10 seconds to deliver the epinephrine. Pull the injector straight out. The needle will retract underneath the safety cap. Firmly massage the injection area for about 10 seconds. Carefully place the used EpiPen somewhere safe. Give it to EMS providers for proper disposal. Hi, I'm Brandon, and together we're going to practice your CPR skills. Cardial pulmonary resuscitation, or CPR, is the care provided for cardiac arrest, a condition in which both breathing and heartbeat have been lost. Your CPR is vital for the person to survive. When performing CPR, you will provide a continuous combination of chest compressions and rescue breaths. These skills are easy to perform. First, let's learn the individual skills, and then we can put them together to do CPR. You will need an adult CPR mannequin and a CPR mask to practice. Be sure to get these before you move on to the next segment. Are you ready to practice compressions? Find a comfortable spot on the floor. Kneel alongside your mannequin, and make sure you're even with the center of the chest. Put the heel of one hand, it doesn't matter which one, on the center of the chest. Put the heel of your other hand right on top of your first. You can interlace your fingers to keep them off the chest. Bring your body up over the top of your hands so you can push straight down. Lock your elbows so you can push with upper body weight. Hear the beat? That's our compression rate. Ready? Let's push together. Push hard, at least two inches in depth. Push fast, at least 100 times a minute. It's okay to push a little harder and faster than you think. 
allow the chest to fully rebound at the top of the compression. This will allow for more blood flow. Okay, let's stop. Nice job. You're doing great. Keep in mind you might be doing this for a while. To keep from getting too tired, make sure you keep your elbows locked and your upper body weight over your hands. Let your body do the work. Now let's try it again from the beginning. We're going to do a set of 30 compressions, which is the number we do in a CPR cycle. Ready? Find your hand positioning. Get your body positioned. Follow the beat. Push hard. Push fast. Allow the chest to rebound all the way up. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Great! If you need more practice with compressions, just play this section over again. Now let's practice giving rescue breaths. Kneel next to the head of your mannequin. Look at your CPR mask to make sure the one-way valve is inserted. Place the mask over the nose and mouth. Put your thumb and forefinger along the top of the mask. Hook the bony ridge of the jaw with your fingers and use your thumb on the bottom of the mask. Tilt the head and lift the chin. This brings the face up into the mask, creates an airtight seal, and opens the airway. Take a breath and blow through the valve opening. Each breath is one second in length and only has enough air to create a visible rise of the chest. See? No more than that, okay? Now we're going to practice together giving two breaths at a time. Be sure to come up off the mouthpiece and take a fresh breath in between them. Ready? Do it with me. How did you do? Let's try again. You're doing great. Let's do a series of two breath sets. If you're still having problems getting chest rise, work on adjusting things to get it. Ready? Here we go. Try not to overventilate. Be consistent. Excellent. One more set. Nicely done. If you need more practice, just play this section over again. Are you ready to put it all together and do CPR? Great. First, we need to go over the steps of checking someone to see if they need CPR. Before checking, make sure it's safe for you to be there. If you get hurt, it will only make things harder to take care of. If someone appears unresponsive, tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you okay? Are you okay? If the person is unresponsive, have another person activate EMS. Check for breathing by looking at the face and chest. Do this quickly. If someone is not breathing or just gasping, you need to do CPR. Let's try the assessment steps together. Try to imagine it's real as we go through them. Ready? Are you okay? Activate EMS. He's not breathing and CPR is the way to care for him. To perform CPR, all you do is repeat cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Think you have it? Great. Now let's put it all together. First, we'll check to see if CPR is needed, then we'll perform two minutes of compressions and breaths. That's five cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. If you get tired, it's okay. Rest a bit and play this section over again. Are you ready? Here we go. Are you okay? Activate EMS.
Well done. Congratulations. You just learned how to do CPR. Let's learn to give CPR to a child. It's not hard to do. To do CPR, you simply perform repeating cycles of chest compressions and rescue breaths. We'll learn those separately, and then when you're ready, we'll put them together to do CPR. You'll need a child CPR mannequin and a CPR mask to practice. Be sure to get those before moving to the next segment. Welcome back. We're going to practice doing chest compressions. Kneel close to your mannequin, near the chest. You'll be using a single hand to do the compressions. Put the heel of your hand on the lower half of the breastbone. Bring your shoulder up above your hand and lock your elbow. Ready? Let's push with the beat. Here we go. Push hard, at least one third the depth of the chest, or about two inches. Push fast, at least 100 times a minute. Allow the chest to fully rebound. You're doing great. Keep your arms straight and use your upper body weight to push. Okay, stop. Let's do a set of 30 compressions from the start. Do them with me. Are you ready? Find your hand position. Let's start. Twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Great! If you need more practice with compressions, just play this section over again. Now let's practice giving rescue breaths. Kneel next to the head of your mannequin. Look at your CPR mask to make sure the one-way valve is inserted. Place the mask over the nose and mouth. Put your thumb and forefinger along the top of the mask. Hook the bony ridge of the jaw with your fingers of the other hand and use your thumb on the bottom of the mask. Tilt the head and lift the chin. This brings the face up into the mask, creates an airtight seal, and opens the airway. Take a breath and blow through the valve opening. Each breath is one second in length and only has enough air to create a visible rise of the chest. See? No more than that, okay? Now let's practice giving two breaths at a time. Be sure to come up off the mouthpiece and take a fresh breath in between them. Ready? Do it with me. Let's try again. You're doing great. Now let's do a series of two breath sets. If you're still having problems getting chest rise, work on adjusting things to get it. Ready? Here we go. Try not to overventilate. Be consistent. Excellent. One more set. Nicely done. If you need more practice, just play this section again. Are you ready to put it all together and perform CPR? Great. First, we need to go over the steps of checking the child to see if he needs CPR. Before checking, always make sure it is safe for you to be there. If a child appears unresponsive, tap or squeeze the shoulder and ask loudly, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? If the child is unresponsive, activate EMS. have another person activate EMS. Quickly check for breathing by looking at the face and chest. If the child is not breathing or just gasping, you need to perform CPR. Let's try the assessment steps together. Are you ready? Are you okay? Activate EMS. He's not breathing, and CPR is the way to care for him. To perform CPR, all you do is repeat cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Let's put it all together now. 
We'll check first to see if CPR is needed, and then we'll provide two minutes of compressions and breaths. That's five cycles of 30 and two. If you get tired, it's okay. Rest a bit and play this section over again. Are you okay? Activate EMS. Congratulations, you now know how to perform CPR on a child. Now let's learn how to give CPR to an infant under one year of age. Remember, CPR provides repeating cycles of chest compressions and rescue breaths. We'll learn those skills separately and then we'll put them together to do CPR. You will need an infant CPR mannequin and an infant CPR mask to practice. Be sure to get those now before starting the next segment. Welcome back. Now we're going to practice doing chest compressions. Position yourself near the chest of the mannequin. You'll be using two fingers to do the compressions. Slide your fingers alongside the nipple line to the center of the chest. You'll push with the tips of your fingers. Ready? Let's push with the beat. Here we go. Push hard, at least one third the depth of the chest, or about one and a half inches. Push fast at least 100 times a minute. You're doing great. Now let's do a set of 30 compressions from the start. Do them with me. Are you ready? Find your finger position. Let's start. Twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty. Nice job. If you need more practice, just replay this segment. Now let's practice giving rescue breaths. Kneel near the head of your mannequin. Look at your CPR mask to make sure the one way valve is inserted. Place the mask over the nose and mouth. Put your thumb and forefinger along the top of the mask. Hook the bony ridge of the jaw with your fingers of the other hand and use your thumb on the bottom of the mask. Tilt the head and lift the chin. 
This brings the face up into the mask, creates an airtight seal, and opens the airway. Take a breath and blow through the valve opening. Each breath is one second in length and only has enough air to create a visible rise of the chest. No more than that, okay? Now let's practice giving two breaths at a time. Be sure to come up off the mouthpiece and take a fresh breath in between them. Ready? Do it with me. How did you do? Let's try again. You're doing great. Let's do a series of two breath sets. If you're still having problems getting chest rise, work on adjusting things to get it. Ready? Here we go. Try not to overventilate. Be consistent. Excellent. One more set. Well done. If you need more practice, just play this section over again. Are you ready to put it all together and do CPR? Great. First, we'll go over the steps of checking an infant to see if he needs CPR. Before checking, always make sure it's safe for you to be there. If an infant appears unresponsive, tap his foot and yell loudly to startle him. If the infant is unresponsive, have another person activate EMS. Quickly check for breathing by looking at the face and chest. If the infant is not breathing or just gasping, you need to perform CPR. Let's try the assessment steps together. Are you ready? Hey, activate EMS. He's not breathing, and CPR is the way to care for him. To perform CPR, all you do is repeat cycles of 30 compressions and two rescue breaths. Let's put it all together now. First, we'll see if CPR is needed, and then we'll provide two minutes of compressions and breaths. That's five cycles of 30 and two. If you get tired, it's okay. Rest a bit and play this section over again. Are you ready? Here we go. Hey, activate EMS.
Congratulations, you now know how to perform CPR on an infant. Amputation is the complete loss of a body part. If an amputation has occurred, quickly assess for and control any severe bleeding. Activate EMS. Amputated body parts can often be surgically reattached. Once the person is stable, locate the severed part. Wrap it in a sterile or clean cloth. Place the part in a tightly sealed plastic bag or waterproof container. Place the bag or container on ice. Do not soak the severed part in water and do not put it directly on ice. Give it to EMS providers for transport with the person to the hospital. Calm, comfort, and reassure the person. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS take over. I can't believe they want to get all these VIN numbers. I'm not going up there. At least we can get this one. An impaled object is an object that penetrates a body part and remains embedded. As a general rule, never remove an impaled object. It can act like a plug and prevent serious blood loss. An impaled object can also be embedded into body structures below the skin. Movement of the object or the body part it is in could create additional injury. If you suspect impalement has occurred, remove or cut away clothing to confirm the object has penetrated the skin. Look for any serious bleeding. Keep the person still to prevent movement. Activate EMS for any significant impaled object or if you are in doubt about its severity. If the injury is bleeding, use a clean pad to apply direct pressure around the base of the object to control it. Use additional padding to stabilize the object. Support the person's weight to relieve pressure on the object. Use padding to provide stability and comfort. Reassure the person to keep him calm. Reassess the person and the injury regularly until EMS arrives. an accident. Oh. Expansion of the chest during breathing causes suction, which pulls outside air containing oxygen through the airway and into the lungs. A puncture injury through the chest wall can disrupt the chest ability to draw air into the lungs. Remove clothing to expose the injury site. Check to see if there is an exit injury on the other side of the chest. If there are two wounds, treat the more serious one first. Air movement through the wound can be indicated by foamy, bloody air bubbles. You may hear a sucking sound. Quickly cover the wound with something airtight. You can start with a gloved hand. Activate EMS. Consider covering the wound with an airtight dressing using materials such as plastic wrap or aluminum foil. The covering should be wide enough to extend two inches or more past the edges of the wound in all directions. If tape is available, tape three sides of the covering to the chest wall. Leave one corner of the material untaped. This will allow trapped air to escape. If possible, allow the person to assume a position he is most comfortable in. Regularly assess the person and the injury until EMS arrives.
Injury to the abdomen may result in a condition known as evisceration, in which abdominal organs protrude through an open wound. It is important to understand that these are functioning organs, and the primary treatment is to protect them from further injury. Activate EMS. Cover any protruding organs with a thick, moist dressing. Do not push the organs back inside the body. Do not apply direct pressure on the wound or exposed internal parts, as this could cause further injury. Regularly assess the person and the injury until EMS personnel arrive. Objects that penetrate the surface of the eye require immediate professional medical care. Foreign bodies propelled at high speed present the highest risk. Activate EMS. Immediate care requires stabilization of the object and reducing additional injury. Do not allow the person to rub the eye. Never try to remove an embedded object. Oh, take it out. No, it's got to stay there, okay? It's Stabilize with a bulky, clean pad. Cover the uninjured eye with a loose pad. Eyes move together. Covering both eyes prevents movement of the affected eye. Covering both eyes can be frightening. Stay with the person and calm, comfort, and reassure him to help reduce anxiety. Regularly assess the person until EMS arrives. Corrosive chemicals splashed into an eye can quickly damage eye tissue. Getting a corrosive chemical in the eye is painful. Affected eyes will appear red and watery. To minimize damage, immediately flood the eye with large amounts of water. Hold the eye open and flush continuously for at least 15 to 30 minutes. Flush outward from the nose side of the affected eye to prevent contamination of the unaffected eye. If the person is wearing contact lenses and the lenses did not flush out from the running water, have the person try to remove the contacts after the flushing procedure. In factories, laboratories, and other occupational settings where there is a known or increased risk for chemical eye burns, specialized therapeutic rinsing solutions that have been properly tested and approved may be available. Follow the established policy and manufacturer's directions for use. Chemical burns to the eye require professional medical care. Activate EMS as quickly as possible. Nosebleeds can occur when small blood vessels inside the nostrils are ruptured. Most nosebleeds are not serious and can be easily handled. Rarely does a nosebleed become life-threatening. To care for someone with a nosebleed, have him sit up straight with his head tilted forward, chin down. Pinch the nose with your thumb and index finger and hold it for about 10 minutes. Do not tilt the head back or have the person lie down. These actions may cause him to swallow blood and vomit. Have him spit out any blood that collects in his mouth. If you cannot stop the bleeding, seek immediate medical attention. A physical blow to the mouth can break, dislocate, or knock out teeth. If the tooth is still in place, get the person to a dentist without delay. If the tooth has been knocked out, early care can increase the chance that a permanent tooth can be successfully reimplanted. 
Control any bleeding. Have the person gently bite down on an absorbent pad. Handle the tooth only by the chewing surface, called the crown. Do not touch the root, the part of the tooth that embeds in the gum. Gently rinse the tooth with water if it is dirty. Never scrub the tooth or remove any attached tissue fragments. If possible, place the tooth back in the tooth socket. If not, keep the tooth moist. Have the person spit into a cup and place the tooth in the saliva. Milk, contact lens solutions, or commercial sports drinks can also be used. Avoid using water. Get the person to a dentist as quickly as possible, preferably within 30 minutes. The faster you act, the better the chance of saving the tooth. Vaginal bleeding may occur during pregnancy. Light, irregular discharges of blood or spotting is normal. However, significant bleeding, especially late in the pregnancy, indicates a more serious problem may be occurring. Severe abdominal cramping and pain can occur. Her skin may be cool, clammy to the touch, and pale in color. She may be weak and lightheaded. Activate EMS immediately. Help her lay down on her left side. When lying face up, the baby puts pressure on a major vein that returns blood to the heart. Laying the mother on her left side improves blood flow to the mother and baby. Have her place a sanitary pad over the vaginal opening. Do not have her insert anything inside the vagina. Treat for shock. Maintain a normal body temperature. Insulate on top and underneath to prevent heat loss. Calm, comfort, and reassure her. Do not give her anything to eat or drink. Reassess regularly until another provider or EMS personnel take over. Bites and stings can occur from a wide variety of insects, reptiles, animals, and even humans. Most are not serious and cause only minor swelling, redness, pain, and itching. In general, care for bites and stings by washing the site with soap and water. As a precaution, always remove jewelry from the affected area. Apply an antibiotic ointment and cover the area with an adhesive bandage or pad. Except for snake bites, apply an ice bag to reduce swelling and pain. Some bites and stings are more serious and can benefit from first aid care. Venomous bites and stings inject venom or poison into the body. Focus on slowing the absorption of venom into the body and quickly activating the EMS system for specialized treatment. Did you see what kind it was? It was a rattler. Here, sit down. Venomous pit vipers, such as cottonmouths, copperheads, and rattlesnakes, strike once and leave a characteristic bite with single or double fang marks. Pit viper bites can cause an intense burning pain and local swelling. Swelling may involve the entire limb within a few hours. If you suspect a pit viper bite, have the person sit still and activate EMS. Control any bleeding with a clean pad and direct pressure. Immobilize the injured part and keep it below heart level. Keep the person warm, reassured, and quiet. A venomous coral snake bite is different than one from a pit viper. Coral snakes chew with fixed fangs. Pain and swelling at the bite site may be minimal or absent. Serious effects are often delayed and can include abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, rapid heartbeat, difficulty breathing, and drooling. The person may develop an altered mental state. If you suspect a coral snake bite, 
have the person sit still and activate EMS. To slow venom spread, apply a pressure bandage around the entire length of the bitten extremity. Wrap toward the body. The bandage should be snug, but not so tight that you can't slip a finger under it. Immobilize the injured part and keep it below heart level. Keep the person warm, reassured, and quiet. Move the person only if needed. When caring for a snake bite, do not apply local cooling. Do not cut through a snake bite wound, apply suctioning, or use a tourniquet. These treatments are not effective and may be harmful. Spiders typically inhabit out-of-the-way places, such as woodpiles or outbuildings. There are certain spiders that can be dangerous to humans. This includes the black widow and the brown recluse. I do not feel good at all. Initially, venomous spider bites are often difficult to identify. Small puncture marks and bleeding may be seen. Tenderness, swelling, pain, itchiness, and redness at the bite site can develop. Over time, cramping pain and muscular rigidity in the body may occur. A person may experience fever, weakness, nausea, and vomiting, or difficulty breathing. If you suspect a severe reaction from a spider bite may be occurring, activate EMS. Keep the person warm, reassured, and quiet. Stinging insects, such as bees, wasps, and fire ants, are normally passive, except when in defense of their nests or territories. Ow. What happened? I got stung. Here, let me see. While wasps and fire ants can sting repeatedly, the stinger of a honeybee detaches from its body remains embedded in the skin, and continues to inject venom. If a stinger is present in the skin, quickly remove it. Local pain, redness, swelling, and itching generally occur at the sting site. It is possible for a life-threatening allergic reaction to arise. Monitor the person for at least 30 minutes to see if his condition worsens. Ticks are blood-feeding insects that are typically found in tall grass and shrubs. The biggest concern with tick bites is the exposure and transmission of infectious disease. When a tick bites, it attaches itself firmly to the skin. To remove it, grasp it close to the skin with tweezers or a tick removal tool. Pull straight up with a steady, slow motion. If portions of the tick remain in the skin, seek further medical attention. Do not use fingernail polish, petroleum jelly, a glowing hot match, or alcohol to remove a tick. These actions have no proven value and may cause additional problems. Stings from marine animals, such as fire coral, sea anemones, and jellyfish, can occur when swimming or diving in the ocean. Stings can result in significant pain at the sting site and a raised, red, itchy rash. Wash the sting site with household vinegar as soon as you are able to for at least 30 seconds to deactivate the venom and prevent further stinging. To help reduce pain, shower or immerse the sting site with hot water for at least 20 minutes or until the pain subsides. The water should be as hot as the person can safely tolerate. What happened? My foot! Stingrays can also be encountered in the ocean. A stingray punctures the skin with a barb to inject venom. Intense pain can occur at the sting site. 
carefully clean out the wound site. Immerse the injured area in water as hot as the person can tolerate for 30 to 90 minutes to deactivate the venom and help relieve pain. Severe reactions to marine animal stings can include difficulty breathing, heart palpitations, weakness, and fainting. If this occurs, activate EMS immediately. Human and animal bites can cause significant injury and bacterial infection. Bites from animals such as raccoons, skunks, bats, and foxes can also cause rabies. Left untreated, rabies is fatal. Wash the bite and flush with large amounts of water. Control any bleeding with direct pressure. Seek professional medical attention.